There are absolutely loads of pronunciation rules in English. If there's a vowel plus a consonant, then an E at the end of the word, then the E is silent and the preceding vowel is modified to a long sound, as in note, cake, fate, not note, fate, kake. But of course, for every rule, there's an exception. Words like come, have, and give. They have the silent E, but not the long sound. It's not comb, have, give. That's just one example, and there are loads of those rules, and some learners and plenty of teachers absolutely love them. But for me, meh. How are you supposed to remember all of these rules when you're trying to have a conversation with an interesting person? You're there trying to impress. You've got to concentrate on being smooth, not remembering a load of rules. Pfft. In reality, it's impossible to remember all of the rules. So should you even bother trying? I think you should be able to leave the rule book at home. But there are some things that I would identify that are so common and so important that we can't really ignore them. Let's call them the big four. Number one, schwa. Schwa. Did you ever learn the phonetic alphabet? Some people did, some people didn't. I didn't. But if you know nothing else, this is the most important sound for making your English sound natural. It's called the schwa and it goes uh and it's everywhere. Uh, uh. Uh, this is the most important sound in English, in my opinion. If you ask the natives, they don't even know they're doing it. They've never heard of a schwa, but they do it in almost every phrase, and it's the absolute secret source to sound like a native. A or A is often replaced with this schwa, the uh sound. A dog, a lamppost, not a dog, a lamppost, a dog, a lamppost. Two often gets schwa as well. Let's go to the park. To the, uh, 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 to the park. Let's go to the park. The schwa is what gives English that uh, 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 softness compared to some other languages. So it sounds like America, not America. America. It's also what makes the British sound British when we have an R at the end of a word. Listen to the endings of these. Water, better, doctor, uh, uh, uh. And absolutely, you could apply some rules and formulas to exactly when to insert a little schwa, but good luck trying to remember them on a Friday night when you've had three lemonades and your hot date wants to know your favorite color and a list of hobbies. The schwa, you just need to be aware of it Listen for it and practice it. In a sentence, the words don't exist in isolation. This is probably the main reason why you can't understand native speakers. We don't pronounce each word individually. We link them all together. And in this process of linking, some sounds get added, some sounds get taken away, and some sounds get completely changed. So when we speak, we're trying to communicate efficiently with economy of movement of the mouth. The minimum amount of effort required for the message to be understood. Of course, this relies on the listener being very familiar with the vocabulary to the point where they can infer ambiguous meaning in real time. I'll slow that down. Advanced learners need to be able to infer ambiguous meaning in real time. That's because in connected speech, there are sounds that aren't words and combinations of sounds that could have different meanings. But the meaning becomes clear to a native or an advanced listener because of the surrounding words, because of the context. For example, have you seen the new display? Now, I could be talking about a new display or a nudist play. Have you seen the new display? Nudists are groups of people who like to go around without any clothes on. Naked. When new and display go together, the nudist sounds could sound like nudist, especially because if we were talking about a nudist play with these two consonants together, I'll probably eliminate the t sound at the end of nudist and link into play so we get nudist play. And if you say this out of context, even native speakers might miss it. What did you do at the weekend? I went to a nudist play. 
Now, unless everybody knows that I'm a nudism enthusiast, or we'd been talking about nudist theatre, then we might have to repeat ourselves because we don't have that context. What, what was that? A nudist play. Oh, right. Number three is stress. Which part of the word or phrase do we emphasize? So we have word stress. If you get this wrong, you might think you sound clear, but you're really gonna confuse the natives. Try this with common words that you know, or with new words. When you learn the meaning, also think about the word stress. Practice. Two syllables, stress on the first. Practice. Pronunciation. How many syllables? Pronunciation. Five syllables, stress on the pronunciation. On the fourth, pronunciation. Nobody. Three syllables, stress on the first. Nobody. Understand. Again, three syllables, but this time stress on the third. Understand. You just have to learn these by listening or it will actually tell you in the dictionary or on Google, they put a little apostrophe before the stressed syllable. Practice, pronunciation, nobody, understand. And you can't really play with word stress, you just have to learn it, it's either correct or incorrect. Understand, correct. Understand, incorrect. And as well as word stress, we also have stress within a phrase or sentence. If you don't practice your pronunciation, nobody will understand you. Where does the stress go in this phrase? Well, there's no single correct answer. This is where it's more of an art than a science. You could say it like this. If you don't practice your pronunciation, nobody will understand you. Or if we're talking about different English skills, like speaking, grammar, reading, pronunciation, then we can emphasize the skill. You can read and write as much as you want, but if you don't practice your pronunciation, no one will understand you. Or if it's a personal tip, like everybody else in the class is practicing pronunciation, then the teacher might say, if you don't practice your pronunciation, nobody will understand you. And remember, we still have to think about the individual word stress too, so there's a lot happening. Number four, intonation. Does the intonation go up or does the intonation go down? Questions are the classic example. What's that? Rising intonation. It's a cup of tea. Falling intonation. So you get the idea with our big four, there's loads happening with pronunciation. But are you really gonna sit down and draw all the phonetics, the stress, the intonation, the connected speech? Well, maybe. And I think it's a really valuable exercise to sit down and really analyze the pronunciation at this level of detail. But don't expect to be thinking about all of these things in real time when you're speaking. It's not realistic. And certainly don't wait until you've done a perfect pronunciation analysis before you start talking. For me, this kind of detailed analysis should be a complement to your main pronunciation practice, which is going to be listening to as much English as possible and imitating what you hear. That way you won't have to think of the rules, you'll just know that understand sounds bad and understand sounds good. The good news is that all of these pronunciation rules can be learned without learning them by listening, exposure to the language, and imitation. So especially if you wanna get your pronunciation as natural as possible, or if you want to imitate a native accent, you need to be imitating. That means making sounds with your mouth that directly copy the sounds going in your ears. And completely disregarding the written form and even the component words of a phrase. Reading and writing can actually be your enemy when it comes to accurate pronunciation. Let me show you what I mean with some animal sounds. And this might come as a surprise to some of you because it came as a surprise to me when I learned this, but animals make different noises in different languages. In English, the dog goes woof, the cat goes meow, and the cock goes cock-a-doodle-doo. But in Spanish, they say wow, meow, and kikiriki. And our Indian animal friends say 
this, this, and this. But of course, all of these are just approximations, representations of the real sounds that the animals make. The real animals sound more like... <laughs> but how do you write that? Same goes for the words that we use when we speak English. The written form is just a visual representation of the real sounds. And when it comes to pronunciation, it's the real sounds that we're interested in. Take this word. If you look at the word when you try to pronounce it, it isn't gonna help. So just listen, thorough, and copy what you hear. Thorough, easy. And you might hear it in a phrase. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Listen to me and then listen to yourself and compare the two. You might even record yourself and listen back. Listen, repeat and copy. And you can do that with your favorite songs, YouTube videos, podcasts. You can imitate whoever you like. So with all that being said, the pronunciation rule that will change your English forever is regular and disciplined practice makes slow and incremental progress. But the beauty of slow and incremental progress is that combined with consistency, those slow incremental improvements will result in a massive improvement over time. If you found this interesting, I think you'll enjoy watching this video next.